uh, the session is going to be recorded uh, for, for posting to our uh, uh, YouTube page later on. Um, uh, so thanks very much for joining us. Once again, we have um, another incredible panel, which I'm enormously excited about. Um, the subject is on uh, emerging accountability structures. Um, and our panelists are Nicholas Rasmussen, who's the executive director of GIFCT, uh, Dia Kiali, who's uh, associate uh, director of advocacy at Mnemonic, Jason Peelmeyer, policy director for the Global Network Initiative. Uh, and uh, we're also uh, going to have in uh, Julia Wono from the Facebook Oversight Board, who uh, uh, should be joining us uh, momentarily. Uh, and of course, uh, moderating things uh, is Evelyn Dweck, a lecturer of law and SJD candidate at Harvard Law School. Uh, I'm enormously excited for the conversation. Uh, Evelyn, um, take it away. Thank you, Michael, and thank you so much for organizing this. Honestly, uh, we couldn't want a better panel to talk about uh, these issues. So this panel really gets a sort of what I think of as like the fundamental Gordian knot uh, in this space, which is that, you know, the, the way our new information ecosystem is constructed is uh, that it seems somewhat problematic. So there's something wrong with these uh, really giant, powerful private corporations uh, making unaccountable decisions about the way in which our public discourse uh, is shaped and, and moves. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, having government actors come in and get their hands dirty uh, with freedom of expression uh, seems also equally problematic. Um, and we don't want the cure here to be worse than the disease. Uh, and so what do we do? How do we sort of solve, square this uh, triangle, um, as Jack Balkan has called it, and um, bring some more accountability um, into, into the space and into what platforms are doing. And we could not ask for, uh, like I said, could not ask for better people to talk about these issues. Um, people who are all in various uh, respects uh, involved in institutions that are trying to find a third way uh, between these two sort of um, not great options, uh, institutions that are trying to bring accountability to platform governance. So uh, I'm going to introduce our panelists in the order, chronological for, for want of a better reason, chronological order for the um, order in which they were the institutions were set up. Uh, then they're going to speak for a little bit about what their institution does, what it is, and uh, how it is targeting that. Um, that accountability problem, and in particular, how it, because of the nature of this conference, how it thinks about it in a global perspective as opposed to just a domestic US one, um, which we often talk about so much. Uh, so, Jason Peelmeyer is the policy director of the Global Network Initiative, which is a multi stakeholder human rights NGO launched in 2008 uh, and working for the protection of freedom of expression and privacy from government interference uh, in the information and communication technology sector uh, in particular. Uh, Nick Rasmussen is the executive director of the GIFCT or uh, Global Internet Forum to Counter Terrorism, uh, which was founded in 2017 by four digital platforms and now transitioning to a new life uh, as an independent organization. And it focuses on cross industry efforts to counter the spread of terrorist and violent, violent extremist uh, content online. Uh, Julia Wono is uh, one of the first 20 members of Facebook's new oversight board, uh, a body set up by Facebook, but now operating independently uh, that is going to be charged with reviewing some of Facebook's most difficult decisions about what content uh, it has on its platform. So we'll hear from uh, those three. And then we're lucky to have comments uh, today from Dia Kiali, the Associate Director of Advocacy at Mnemonic, uh, which is the parent organization for Syrian Archive, Yemeni Archive, and Sudanese Archive. Um, Dia is also the co-chair of the Christchurch Call Advisory Network and a member of two GIFCT working groups um, and their advocacy has particularly been focused on how companies are removing human rights documentation and counter speech uh, as terrorist and violent extremist content um, but on the other hand are leaving up a whole bunch of other problematic uh, material as well so uh, like I said uh, we we have so much uh, great expertise here and I think with that I will pass it over to Jason thanks so much Evelyn um so real pleasure to be a part of this panel. Thank you um, to, uh, to Michael and Nicholas and everyone at uh, the ISP for organizing um, and to all the co-panelists. Uh, the two questions that Evelyn asked us to try and address briefly at the outset are, what is the accountability problem that the initiative is trying to solve? And how does the global nature of the problem affect 
accountability and, and what are the institutional features uh, that help address that aspect of the challenge. Um, and I think for GNI and, and maybe also for some of these other initiatives, you really can collapse the answers into one because it is in fact the global nature of the internet that creates some of the accountability and other coordination challenges that require the kind of creative governance um, that I think the institutions that we'll be talking about today exhibit. So um, GNI is the oldest of these and, and goes back all the way to the mid 90s, um, which uh, is a long time ago, uh, especially for people who um, uh, maybe were not on the internet in those days. And so you know, when I teach, for example, um, at Georgetown, uh, I often have to explain what Yahoo is and the fact that you know in the mid 90s yahoo was kind of like what facebook is today um and um it was in that time period that yahoo and, and google and microsoft um uh, were really scaling very quickly to become truly global companies um, and as a result began to feel a lot of pressure from governments in jurisdictions all over the world including uh places where it Oh no, we were doing so well. Have, have you all lost Jason as well? Yeah. Uh, oops. Oh, we lost you momentarily, Jason, Sorry. but you are, you're back. So maybe okay. just uh, go back about 20 seconds. <laughs> Great. Just saying that, you know, as these companies were scaling and confronting government demands from a whole bunch of different jurisdictions, including many uh, that didn't share the same First Amendment and Fourth Amendment uh, sort of uh, principles that they had uh, sort of grown up with in, in, in California and in the United States, um, they had to address the, um, the variety of claims that were coming in. Uh, and there was, you know, a certain amount of resistance, um, but ultimately um, some high profile incidents where user data, uh, what, what user content was censored or user data was ultimately get, given over to authoritarian regimes with uh, predictable consequences. And once that became public, it sparked what I sometimes refer to as the first crisis in content, uh, in confidence in internet companies. Um, and I know we've had many more since then, um, but that that crisis um, led to a number of different conversations in parallel. Um, there was a company-led conversation, um, the Business uh, and Social Responsibility Group, BSR, spearheaded. There was an academic conversation that um, the Oxford Internet Institute, Berkman, uh, and others were involved in. Uh, and then there was an NGO conversation. Um, and ultimately, those merged together and led to the development of the Global Network Initiative. Um, it's important to note that this was happening against the background of kind of broader interest and engagement on questions of responsible business conduct. Um, so there were multi-stakeholder initiatives like the Fair Labor Association, which addresses labor standards in the global apparel supply chain uh, and the voluntary principles on security and human rights, which address uh, security related human rights violations in the extractives industry. Those both were established around 2000 um, so there was a precedent um, for this kind of multi-stakeholder governance. Um, uh, and so GNI um, initially was a sort of negotiation around what good responsible business conduct should look like when tech companies are facing government demands that might put user rights at risk. Uh, and once those principles were hammered out, um, the civil society organizations um, were not content to just leave it there. And so there was further pressure to actually create a governance mechanism to ensure that companies that signed on to these principles were actually implementing them in practice. Um, one other thing, just historically, before I get into sort of how GNI does that, um, it's notable that for GNI, as well as for these other multi-stakeholder initiatives, uh, in addition to the sort of public outcry, there was also a lot of political pressure. Um, and there were a series of uh, now kind of famous congressional hearings uh, where uh, Tom Lantos, uh, among others, sort of skewered the executives of these tech companies uh, the famous line is uh, from Tom Lantos is, while technologically and financially you are giants, morally you are pygmies, uh, which is why GNI staff's uh, team trivia name, uh, whatever we do now these days, virtual trivia is moral pygmies. Um, so now you get the joke if you ever see us. Uh, the, um, and it's interesting because right back then they were actually much smaller than they are now. Um, uh, but even then there was this sort of uh, contrast being drawn between their size and their financial resources and then what was happening in terms of the, the respect for user rights. Um, so GNI addresses the accountability problem um, of this sort of cross-jurisdictional 
um, multi-jurisdictional um, challenge that the companies face in trying to protect their users' rights in a consistent manner. Um, on the basis of these agreed set of principles and implementation guidelines, um, and then through an assessment process that is very bespoke um, and kind of original. Um, so how that works in short is companies that commit to the GNI principles um, also commit to undergoing uh, periodic assessment by independent assessors who are accredited by the Global Network Initiative itself. Um, they can pick among that pool of accredited assessors and the assessors go in and work with people inside the company to do what's called a process assessment, looking at the policies, systems, and procedures that the company has developed to implement the principles and guidelines. Um, that includes sort of looking to make sure that they are there in paper. It includes interviewing staff to make sure that they are well trained and understand how these mechanisms should work. This is things like, you know, es uh, escalation chains um, uh, and also um, sort of board level oversight. Um, then uh, the assessors also look at a series of case studies um, to see how these systems and policies are working in practice. Um, typically around eight case studies from the kind of two year assessment window. Um, these can be nominated by a non company members uh, of GNI. They can be identified by the assessor, or they can also be uh, identified by the company. Um, and they then produce a report, uh, which is submitted to the GNI board. GNI's board has representation from the four membership constituencies so companies, civil society, academics, and investors. Uh, and uh, the board will then review the assessment, interview the assessors, interview the company. Uh, and ultimately decide if the company is implementing the principles and, and guidelines in good faith with improvement over time. So that's the standard that uh, they're expected to meet. In addition to assessment, GNI also um, has a couple of other useful features. Um, one is a shared learning facility, essentially an ability to bring all of our members together to address issues that are emerging or maybe coming around the corner. Um, assessment is very detailed and robust, but it's inherently retrospective um, and the learning facility is meant to be more dynamic and, uh, and nimble. Um, and all of that is facilitated by a degree of confidentiality that the, our members commit to, which is very important. And then the last piece is policy advocacy. It's my primary responsibility. Um, there's a recognition among all of our members that, you know, um, the best way to solve the problem is for all countries to have laws that respect free expression and privacy and then therefore the delta uh, in terms of you know what they expect of companies and, and what the companies want to do to protect their user rights is much smaller. Um, obviously that's not the world we're living in, but we do try and you know work together uh, towards that end. So we, we coordinate our members own advocacy. Uh, we also do advocacy in our own voice. Um, and I think that's important because we're able to sort of uh, help pre-negotiate to some extent um, some baseline uh, consensus across a pretty wide variety of stakeholders about what good should look like when you're thinking about, you know, uh, law enforcement demands or surveillance or um, uh, efforts to address content regulation. Um, so we, we do a lot of that work internally to sort of uh, hammer out a consensus and then try and present that to lawmakers um, and hope that it will be helpful to them as they um, create new, new laws and policies and regulations. Um, the last thing I'll just say before before ending my initial uh, kind of intervention is that um, we have expanded our membership quite a bit over the last few years, and I think that has helped us to address the truly sort of global nature of the challenge. Um, so for the early years, most of the companies uh, in GNI were were platform companies, and they were American. Um, uh, in 2017, a group of uh, European telecommunications companies who operate all over the world uh, joined into GNI as a group um, and really expanded, diversified our, our um, company constituency. We've since had uh, equipment uh, vendors like Nokia and Ericsson as well join, uh, and also um, more recently, um, a social media company based out of Japan called Line, which is our first non-Western company. Um, but almost certainly not our last. Uh, and then a content delivery network, which is Cloudflare uh, recently joined as an observer. So we're, I think, really proving the, the principle that, that guided the work at the beginning, which is that we need a common set of principles that can apply across the ICT sector. Um, and then our civil society constituency has also diversified quite significantly. And we now have uh, groups from um, Latin America, um, Middle East, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. 
which really helps us to understand what's happening in those countries, uh, both in terms of the dyna dynamics between the companies and, uh, and, and, and in vulnerable communities and others on the ground, as well as how governments are approaching these challenges. Um, so I will stop there, um, and Evelyn, I'm happy to answer any specific questions you have before we move on. No, I think we'll come back to questions. So for now, uh, Nick, could you please uh, take it away? Sure, thanks, Evelyn. And I'm, I'm, I'm actually really glad that, that you started with Jason because Jason kind of by going a little further back in history set a pretty great frame for the way in which other, others of these multi-stakeholder fora um, have kind of joined the scene and joined the, the effort a little bit later in the story in response to particular problems that emerged over time. And GIFCT, as you mentioned, um, Evelyn, was founded in 2017 um, by the four platform technology companies that were that, that remain the founding members and, and constitute the operating board of GIFCT. Um, and if you think back to where we were in time at that moment, that was a period of time when there was quite a bit of pressure on these companies um, because of the, the proliferation, the explosion of content related to the to terrorism and extremism, particularly but specifically um, tied to the Islamic State, Daesh. Um, the, you know, the foreign fighter movement was in its heyday during that period. You had um, these technology platforms being used as a, as a vehicle to bring, to attract adherence to a particular terrorism um, um, cause. Um, and, and the pressure these companies were under um, led them in the direction of collective action. Collective action being um, an opportunity to um, maybe share knowledge, uh, perhaps um, combine efforts, work across company competitive lines where shared goals could be identified. So GIFCT began in 2017 in this, in this period where, where, where that collective action was really an imperative. It operates and has operated since 2017 in a framework that focuses on prevent, respond, and learn. Do what you can to prevent content tied to terrorism from making its way onto the platforms in the first place, when it does make its way onto these platforms, respond appropriately, quickly, uh, in a way that uh, addresses the, the content, and then learn, um, advance the state of knowledge and understanding about the problem so that you can be more effective at the preventing and the responding part. Um, a lot of that work takes place through um, e-learnings, workshops, um, sponsored research, the kind of things that can be shared across the industry without worrying about the proprietary information. A kind of shared learning space that GIFCT operates in since 2017, I think has been the, probably its, its most salient feature. Um, beyond that though, there is a mechanical operational component to GIFCT's work that involves information sharing. I know Ellen, this is something you've been focused on in your work in particular. Um, the information sharing component of, of GIFCT's work is a hash sharing database, a database of information that the comp that companies who wish to participate, who are members of GIFCT and wish to participate in the hash uh, database process, um, can input material that they've identified in their on their platform tied to terrorism or violent extremism. They can attach a hash to it, a digital um, a digital expression, and then that material can be shared with other companies so that they can use those identifying fingerprint style hashes to allow for ready um, addressing of the content on their platforms. Um, you can of course see why that is both um, a step in the direction of information sharing and, and efficiency in, in, the, in, the, in the cause, uh, in the service of, of content uh, moderation and content removal. But of course it raises questions about what material, who puts it in, what decision-making processes surround it, um, what appeal mechanisms might there be for addressing material that is in it? Again, the number of questions you can imagine is, is pretty expansive. Um, to get to the kind of particular topic of the, of the conversation today and accountability mechanisms, mechanisms, one of the accountability mechanisms or problems that GIFCT was trying to address concerns the impact of content moderation efforts on fundamental human rights. Because um, GIFCT set out to do um, more effective work on content moderation, but within a framework where fundamental human rights and particularly freedom of, of expression are respected fully. And so I think it's not hard to, to explain to this group how it's possible to overachieve in, in service of content moderation goals. Um, the, the idea of getting as much possible 
much of the volume as possible of, of, of terrorism-related content off of the platforms um, can lead to solutions that have un, unintended consequences or leave us uh, with, with outcomes that, that infringe upon the rights or, or, the, or the important interests that we may have as societies for other objectives. And so again, that, that is one of the reasons why GIFCT has kind of entered into the public conversation in the way it, it has. Um, I, I know, you know this, um, Evelyn, but just for some of the audience, Evelyn has referred to GIFCT as being a sort of content cartel. And of course, a cartel comes with a certain um, degree of baggage with it when you describe something as a cartel. No one says, oh, what's my favorite cartel? Um, or I don't have a, at least I haven't met anybody that has a favorite cartel that they point to. When we think of cartels, we typically tend to think of the Cali cartel, the Sinaloa cartel, or OPEC uh, at, the, at the point when, when price setting and price fixing in the, in the petroleum industry was, was such a big issue. But clearly the, the point is there is a lack of accountability or sufficient accountability and transparency to some of the work that GIFCT um, does, at least in the perception of some stakeholders. And that's something that has to be addressed and it's why I'm really pleased to be part of this conversation today. Um, one way you can address these accountability questions is by seeking greater transparency. And then um, the thing I didn't mention about GIFCT's organizational history, the, the, um, Evelyn alluded to it, was that earlier this year, um, the organization was trans um, transitioned from being an effort of the companies by the companies using their own staffs and their own capabilities to instead being a, a standalone non-governmental organization with me as an executive director. So that that organizational transition to an independent NGO um, will give me the latitude to pursue, I think, a transparency and accountability agenda that might have been diff more difficult when the responsibility was, was maintained inside the companies. Uh, another way we try to bring accountability into this conversation with GIFCT is the creation of our independent advisory committee, a, a group of 20 organizations and individuals who now serve on an, in, in an independent way um, as advisors to GIFCT and who can, I've referred to them in a couple of public settings as the conscience of, I, of, of the GIFCT. Um, I look to them to call us out when we need to be called out on not living up to what we, what we say we are aiming to do. Last thing I'll do, and I know I'm at time, is, is just quickly attach this to the global nature of this conversation. There are two pieces of the global um, theme for this conference that attach to the GIFCT work. And one surrounds membership. Um, it's one thing to start a GIFCT organized around Facebook, Twitter, Microsoft, Google, companies that are you know, rooted based in, in Silicon Valley. And because they're um, American owned or American um, run, they operate within a rule of law tradition. They operate within a, a certain framework that you may not see in every country around the world. Well, obviously the social media landscape, the, the online landscape for um, for terrorism and extremism extends well beyond platforms of that sort. So one of the issues we will confront in the period ahead in GIFCT is how to think about inclusion of, com of companies and platforms who may not emanate or come from uh, a place where um, a rule of law tradition is embedded. And I know Jason, you referred to, you, you know, alluded a little bit to this as you expand your membership and, and, uh, and the group of companies involved with your work. And then the last bit uh, I would say about the global piece is stakeholder voices. We need to do a better job at GIFCT of, of working with civil society organizations in all parts of the world, not simply those um, that, that have come into first contact with us, be those in Western Europe or the United States or, or other Western democracies. And so I hope if I were here a year from now, I could point to a much wider circle of stakeholders who would be engaged with GIFCT um, to include much more engagement with the global South. I'll stop there, uh, Evelyn, as I know I'm a bit over, but uh, look forward to the conversation. Uh, that's great. Thank you, Nick. And uh, yeah, you know, Content Cartel isn't intended fully to be a compliment, but I, of course, say it with uh, with all due affection. And uh, look, the, the fact that you are engaging uh, with the work, and, and I, I appreciate it, um, is, you know, is a very positive sign. So thank you very much. Uh, Julie, could you take it away, please? Sure. Good morning, everyone. First of all, I have to apologize. I was trying to lock my doors for preventing my kids to come in the middle of the meeting. So I apologize, I, I came a bit late. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here this morning for me and afternoon and evening for, for others. Uh, and thanks to uh, Nicholas and, and Michael 
and the whole year ISB for the invitation. Uh, and I feel privileged to be a part of the conversation uh, along very esteemed colleagues that I've, who I've been working with uh, for some years. Um, uh, I will be talking about the, the oversight board and uh, trying to respond to Evelyn's uh, questions around, first of all, what accountability problem we're trying to solve, and uh, secondly, what, um, how do we take into account the globality uh, of, you know, of the platforms we are working on. So to respond to the first question, I think it's, it's interesting to go a bit back uh, you know, in the past and remember where we were in 2016, 2018, all complaining uh, about Facebook's, to, to name it among others, but particularly Facebook's uh, in incapacity in, uh, you know, in protecting our, well, the US vote or the UK referendum or um, many other preventing people from being killed in, in, in countries like Myanmar. So, um, what, what was interesting is that early, early on, uh, several voices, you know, raised to uh, question that lack of accountability and also uh, make suggestions, uh, and particularly suggestions around users should know why their content is not being taken down or why the content is being taken down by Facebook. What's, what, what are the rationale? And uh, I think to, to get the expression from our director, Thomas Hughes, the, the oversight board is really about that. It's really about you know reversing the black box that and the secrecy that surrounds Facebook and Instagram's decision because uh, our mandate in, extends to to that social platforms as well. Um, and to do so, the 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 company Facebook, as you rightly said, Evelyn, at the beginning, initiated a set of consultations, worldwide consultations involving uh, I don't have the exact figures, but hundreds of organizations, of individuals, experts, uh, asking them questions about what would you like to see uh, in uh, an institution that would be able to reverse our decisions on our moderation, uh, well, to reverse our moderation decisions. And uh, to my, in my opinion, the result is, uh, was, before I joined the OSB, was very interesting. Uh, full disclosure of my organization, Antonio San Francisco participated in some of the two of the consultations. And um, uh, what has resulted is today a, an independent, transparent, inclusive, and that's very important for the second question, deliberative body that will make binding decisions on Facebook and Instagram's takedown or live up decisions. For the live up decision, I have to, uh, have to specify uh, very important information. We have started, so the oversight board takes appeals from users and from Facebook, users whose content has been taken down by, by the companies, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, but in the future, they will also be able, users will also be able to contest decisions by the platforms to leave up content on uh, its social media platform. So uh, uh, we're taking appeals from users, but also we're taking appeals from, well, appeals well, request for decisions from, from Facebook. Uh, and, and that's interesting because uh, from, in, in my interpretation, and I think in, in that of many others, it, it's really a sign that the, the company, and, and I think it's, a, it's an interesting you know, um, form of humility. The company recognizes that it, well, it has done a very bad job <laughs> and still continues to do so. So it does need uh, to uh, get some interesting guidance from a set of personalities and, and experts on the on the issues around content moderation and freedom of expression in general. Uh, what I have to specify uh, also is that uh, about the scope of our decision is that we will uh, our, our endeavor is to make sure that well the community standards of Facebook that are applied by the platform and that are the law applied by the platform uh, with, with regards to content. Well, making sure that these community standards align with the most basic, but it's, it's very unfortunate to talk about, to say basic, but it's really, you know, protecting freedom of expression should not be, you know, rocket science. It's, it's, it's a principle. It's really, uh, it's a fundamental principle. So uh, making sure these community standards align with these human rights standards uh, in line with many uh, international 
international uh, conventions uh, and, uh, and, and other international texts uh, that protect these rights, but also that ask companies to protect these rights. And uh, we particularly endeavor to apply uh, principles from the U UN guiding principles uh, on business and human rights, which strongly invite companies to um, enforce and respect and mitigate the negative effect they might have, their activities might have on human rights. So uh, I will particularly insist on and focus on two aspects of our institution, uh, the independence and the transparency. I know these are uh, really, I think the word is contentious issues. Uh, please correct me if I'm, if I'm not using the right word, but you know, issues where there has been a lot of disagreements. Um, first, the independence. So we're, uh, we're 20 members uh, and we will be 40 members uh, at, at the end of the, of the whole process. So we're 20 inaugural members uh, who's, who are not employees of Facebook. Uh, we've all, we, we have our, um, uh, we have regulation, not regulation, we have rules on conflicts of interest with the company. Um, we are employees, I mean, not employees, we're, um, we have working relationship with the oversight board, which is a trust, I mean, which is managed by a trust uh, that was uh, created last year, I think, and that has uh, received uh, funding from, uh, well, the company to make sure it functions. Uh, and we report to the trust and the trustees and not to Facebook in any way possible. We have barely contacts with the company. The con contacts that we have is in the frame of the decisions that we, we will make. Um, other, another aspect that I think is important to, to stress on since we're talking about solving an accountability problem is really the transparency issue. Uh, we want to be the exact opposite of what has been done by Facebook in the past years. So we'll, we'll publish a yearly report, uh, well, to criticize our work. Are we efficient? Are we useful? <laughs> that, that is also a question to ask. Um, and, um, yeah, are we making the, the difference that we're supposed to make? Um, and also another way to be transparent is all, and it's also linked to the issue of inclusivity, is to be open to third parties. And that's something that we really uh, want to, to be central to our work, not being isolated on our, on our, you know, in our group of 20 people but being open and still working with the groups that we've been working with individually, uh, but also beyond uh, making sure that, well, in, in our decision process, we have opening for uh, third party comments, make use careers from uh, organization, expert organizations, and also ongoing engagements with civil society organizations, not only in Europe or in Northern America, but also, and that's something that I really, really care about also in in, in africa uh where <laughs> there are lots of facebook and instagram users uh, as a reminder uh 70 percent of users on the platforms on facebook particularly are outside of the united states and i think that that figure is particularly interesting and quite striking um so yes being open to uh to just you know to other other people <laughs> beyond the the, the realms of the, the oversight board. Um, I didn't specify that we will also be able to make policy recommendations based on our decisions, uh, policy uh, recommendations, while well, helping Facebook to enhance its community standards. Uh, but of course, these are just recommendations. But what's interesting is that the company will have to respond to, this, to these recommendations as well. So publish, uh, explanations with regards to why it will not or why it will to implement some of our uh, recommendations. Now, uh, on the issue of globality, how are we making sure that we are, um, we, well, we encompass as much as possible the globality of the platforms? The first response is us. The 20 members are uh, come from very different geograph geographical political, professional backgrounds, and many others. Uh, I, for, for instance, I, I'm Cameroonian, and I'm also, uh, I lived 20 years in France, so I have a very good knowledge of both countries, and I would say of 
Europe and Africa, having lived in Moscow as well, Eastern Europe. Um, I, my, one of my colleagues is from India, another colleague is from Pakistan, another one from Taiwan. I mean, it's, it's the, the, the geographical composition is, is quite diverse. Um, beyond that, as I was saying, uh, central to our work will be our ability to remain open to what is happening in our world without necessarily commenting or without necessarily advocating in whatsoever way. Again, the oversight board is here to be deliberative and to provide overarching, overarching principles that will guide the platforms to do better on a daily basis. But we're definitely not here and not at all in this capacity of being super moderators who will oversee what is happening in the second on the different platforms. That's simply impossible. Um, so I think I have answers to both of the questions, uh, but I'm sure I forgot anything. So please, I look forward to the discussion and to these questions. Thank you so much. No, I didn't miss anything at all. Thank you, Julie. That was a wonderful overview. Uh, and now I'll uh, pass it to Dia for their response and uh, comments and, and uh, some uh, information about mnemonic as well. Great, thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, I guess I'm just going to start with, um, with a little story, actually. Um, I promise you this will be relevant. So uh, a few years ago, I was sitting at an invite only event that was about platform accountability. Um, when I was invited to this event, they sent the guest list along and I took a look at the guest list and I said, is this an event about platform accountability for the United States? And they said, no, it's, it's, a, it's a global event. And I said, so what, what is going on with this list of invitees? I'm, I'm really unclear on, uh, on how, you, how you chose them. But since it seems like there's a real lack of folks from the Global South, um, let me give you five, five names that you should absolutely invite and another 15 that I think could be good additions. Um, unfortunately, lo and behold, when I got to the event, none of the people that I'd suggested had been invited. And unfortunately, almost everybody in the room was uh, from a global NGO or from a funder. Um, and there was uh, less than, I think, 5% of the event um, was people who were not based in the US or the EU. Um, so then here I am, I'm at the event and uh, we're doing a big go around. Everybody from the event is sitting there and, and we're talking about sort of what we're excited about talking about. And um, a, a, a person stands up, um, he's a cisgender white man. Um, this is pertinent, uh, I promise. And he says, you know, it's really great to be in this room with all of you guys. I'm, I'm, I'm just so excited to be in this room with, with so much expertise. You know, there's no one doing this kind of work outside of this room. Um, <laughs> at this point, um, you know, it was a whole go around, so all of us were speaking, and I stood up along with two other people, um, one other person who is a, a white woman, but who's been talking about these things for a long time, and another person who was from South Asia, and all three of us said, you know, we're really concerned to hear you say that, because that's completely inaccurate. Um, uh, there are a lot of people outside of this room who are talking about this, and in fact, this happened after um, a big event at RightsCon in 2018, where a bunch of folks um, formed something called the Global South Facebook Coalition to talk about how people need to be having a more global conversation. Um, so, so after we, we said, hey, you know, that's, that's really not accurate. And actually, there's a lot of people working on this. Um, his response was, great, can you make me a list? Um, now, I'm bringing this up because, uh, you know, this was a few years ago and some things have changed, but a lot hasn't. And what we still see over and over again is actually that people who are from the Global South, um, and quotation marks, by the way, uh, I just want to say the Global South, like we need to remember the Global South is a really problematic term and that it refers to a lot of places that are not in the South. Um, it's just a lot of, but, but we use it because we don't, because we don't have the time to, to really explain what we mean. And you know, that's part of the problem is that a lot of times we're talking in categories um, and we're talking about representation, like we have to figure out this, we have to figure out that, but it's, it's a lot more complicated. But anyway, so with that disclaimer, I just wanna say, um, you know, this is something that we see over and over again. Um, you know, I think even, uh, even on this panel, maybe, you know, um, we have some representation, but we also, we also are lacking um, quite a bit. So, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's a topic that I think sometimes um, 
thinking of something, thinking of the global impacts and, and actually designing our conversations and designing our policy making and designing our design actually. Um, you know, we could have an entire panel uh, about how do we design platforms and tools and policies that work with, for example, things other than English um, language <laughs> and, 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 you know, forget about non-Latin characters, you're gonna have a real problem there. So, um, so there's, just, there's just so much that can be done. And, and unfortunately, um, one of the things I think that people in civil society have run into over and over again is really this goal of kind of trying to simplify things, get the easy answer. Um, so now I'm aware I've already spoken for half of my time with that story. So I'm just gonna jump into some of the points I wanted to make. And I think I'm gonna hold off a little bit on talking about uh, mnemonic if folks have questions. I'll just say that one of the things that I'm dealing with, um, that mnemonic is dealing with, and that is actually a really global conversation is as Evelyn mentioned, um, you know, we're seeing a, a, a lot of human rights documentation get removed from platforms, um, particularly as um, it, when it's been deemed to be terrorist and violent extremist content. Uh, for folks who didn't see me, I'm doing quotation marks because there's no definition of what that actually is that's agreed upon. Um, but then we're seeing a lot of, uh, outside of mnemonic, I'm also working on this issue more broadly, we're seeing a lot of really dangerous content get, get left up. Um, so uh, I won't go too much into that. I'm just gonna say, uh, you know, um, I think one of the big, biggest questions is about resources, right? Um, so there was a, a question in the chat box about multi-stakeholder forums. Um, you know, time is also a resource. So civil society, uh, we keep trying to find the, the time to participate in these conversations, um, in these forums, in surveys, in research, uh, but, you know, we have a lot of other things to be doing. I'm, um, I, I spend part of my week uh, engaged in these conversations and I might spend the rest of my week emergency archiving content that could potentially be used in the International Criminal Court later. You know, um, a lot of us in civil society, who, particularly people who are coming from the most uh, affected places, the most affected communities, the places where people are seeing their documentation get deleted from platforms or where they are seeing content that is um, leading to people who look like them getting lynched or having their homes or their stores burned down. We are also the people who need to be in these conversations. And so it gets really, really difficult when there's not enough resources for that. Um, you know, so I think uh, uh, one thing that I really, I, I wanted to mention, just we have seen some shifts in that. Um, we have seen institutions like GIFCT, GNI, and, and the External Oversight Board. I think what's really important is is seeing companies actually put resources into that. So the external oversight board in particular has been very interesting. Julie um, touched on some of this, but you know, I think one of the things that's most interesting is creating an independent trust, taking resources out of Facebook, putting them, them outside of the company, um, and, and also really just the extensive, I think, com uh, community consultation that went into putting the external oversight board together. Um, you know, that, that to me is one thing that I, I think we in civil society would really like to see more of. Um, but then again, when it comes to making something global, look, just like, uh, you know, when we talk about um, privilege, when we talk about someone's starting from, it has a different starting point. Um, there are also different starting points for companies. Companies are starting from a place where they did a very, very, very poor job of looking at things globally. And now there's so much catch up to do. So, so you know, um, how much I think can institutions like GNI, like GIFCT, like the External Oversight Board kind of help with some of that catch up, um, you know, sort of address some of the sort of ingrained issues that we've seen that lead to platforms not functioning very well in places or having really negative impacts on democracy or on, um, on other human rights, freedom of expression, but also, you know, there's also a, a human right to live. Um, so, so thinking about all of these things, I think that's, that's one, of the, one of the most difficult things to sort of address. So I, I, I tweeted early at the beginning of this that GIFCT, for example, has a huge ask People are asking you to address this problem and, and multiple um, stakeholders as well. I, I'd love to hear the other panelists speak a little bit to that. You know, you're balancing civil society and government and companies. And, and I think that's really difficult. Um, okay, so I, I, I think the, the last thing I'm gonna say, I'm just gonna share a very, very quick story and then I'm gonna wrap up um, about how I started getting involved in this work. 
So six years ago, there was a big to do because a bunch of drag queens got kicked off of Facebook for not using their legal names. Um, very opportune time to bring this up actually because we just wrapped up Transgender Week of Awareness and um, this is how I started getting involved in this conversation. This is pertinent because what happened is that those, those drag queens and then also um, transgender people in particular transgender youth, you know, we, we very affected communities by real name policies. We were able to raise a big fuss in San Francisco, get lots of press around this issue, do demonstrations in front of the Facebook office. And Facebook was actually responsive to some of the, the, the demands of that community. But at the same time, um, drag queens and transgender people were saying, hey, what about all the activists outside of the US who are affected by this policy, whose lives are put at risk? What about domestic violence survivors? What about all these other groups? And Facebook really didn't want to deal with that. And they really wanted to be able to address the easier issue of drag queens and transgender people, particularly in the US, and not think about some of the other really vulnerable groups. In particular, at that time, violence connected to online content was really on the rise in India. And feminists and anti-caste activists were really heavily impacted. And despite civil society's attempts, to sort of build a coalition and talk about that together, the platform really wanted to pull it apart, you know. So I think um, that that has always, to this day, sort of impacted how I approach this conversation. Um, and again, about resources, right? It was about the resources that that they were willing to put into addressing one group as opposed to another group. So um, I know I, I went a few minutes over time. I'm so sorry. I'm going to wrap up there and really looking forward to the discussion. Wow. Okay. Amazing. Thank you very much, dear, for uh, really uh, forceful and uh, important comments. Um, so we now have about 25 minutes um, and we're going to engage in uh, question and response. I'm going to sort of start off by throwing it back to the, the panel with a few questions based on uh, Dia's comments and some of my own questions. But um, so we've got some great questions already coming in in the chat. And I think that's probably going to be the best way to keep doing this. So if you do have questions, uh, please put them in the chat and I'll try and feed them into the conversation as we go along. Um, so, I mean, I, I love uh, Julie's optimism that protecting freedom of expression should not be rocket science. Uh, hearing that, I don't know, I had this sort of like, uh, maybe I'm biased, but I, it's like, isn't it maybe harder? Uh, this is a really, really tricky issue. Um, and one of these, one of the problems is this global nature and, and then the different sort of uh, different jurisdictions, the, the, just the scope of it, but also the clashes of what does even protecting freedom of expression uh, really mean? And I think, um, Dia sort of really uh, focusing us on that question of like uh, global nature and the the importance of paying attention to it in other jurisdictions uh, is really important. And so I want to go back to the panel um, and ask them to talk a little bit more about that. You all sort of adverted to it uh, in, in your comments, but maybe to speak sort of more specifically about uh, how you think about that. So something that was really interesting and a common theme from all three of you about the genesis of your institutions was the nature of political pressure, was how important uh, political pressure was to these institutions being created. Um, and it strikes me that that's perhaps one of the reasons as well why we tend to have panels, institutions, uh, media stories that focus on places like the United States because of that political pressure. And so how do you think Think about in your institution um, sort of trying to rebalance that to, to address the questions that Dia was raising about bringing more resources, more awareness, more um, attention uh, to those other markets uh, and, and areas where there isn't as much pressure. If I could jump in just to correct, I probably expect myself very, very badly. I didn't say protecting freedom of expression was in itself rocking, was rocking that, but rather the idea of having to protect it should be, you know, a principle oh, no. for all. So just wanted to make that clear. Of too. course, I was Nothing. only teasing. I, I, uh, I, I'm sure we all agree that it's very, very thorny. Um, <laughs> let's let's I, go in, in, in order. I should have oh, specified. Sure. So Jason, do you want to go, go first? Yeah, sure. So just a couple of quick comments. I think, um, so there's kind of a, the challenge is, is multidimensional um, when it comes to the sort of government pressure angle, because I think what we're seeing is on the one hand, that in the last few years, a lot more interest in, uh, and just focusing here on the content regulation side, um, putting aside kind of privacy and surveillance for a minute, um, but, but there are parallels there as well. A lot more interest in regulating um, how, platforms are dealing with content uh, 
In particular, you know, the European Union has been quite, quite aggressive on this. And we see more movement here in the US as well. Uh, and we see it in Australia, we see it in a number of other kind of global North uh, countries. Um, and one of the things we often try to bring into those conversations is the, the sort of the international cross sort of, not only the, the sort of cross boundary impacts that these regulations can have if they're not drafted carefully uh, and implemented carefully, uh, but also the precedent that they set, right? And in, in terms of creating um, uh, expectations and there's been you know, good work documenting this. And for example, um, in relation to the next DG legislation that Germany passed a few years ago, um, and just seeing how, you know, whole from whole cloth pieces of that, that sometimes the whole architecture had been um, used as starting points for regulation in other countries that are, that have less um, sort of uh, holistic democratic uh, accountability rule of law mechanisms to check the, the potential for, for overreach and abuse. Um, and that, so that's not, that's a sort of point of view that we try and bring in and to say, look, you know, um, e even while this may make the, the underlying issues are indeed ones that need to be grappled with and this approach may make sense in your context, whatever, whoever you are, um, be aware of the fact that this um, not only can serve as a model uh, for what other governments might do in other contexts, but but also can often be actually used, right? Like the legal mechanisms, once they're established, um, sometimes can be manipulated by actors who are external to the the jurisdiction in which the law uh, is being implemented. Um, on the flip side, um, and so, yeah, so we see that, I mean, and I think it's it's really challenging. Um, we've also seen governments um, outside of the global north um, become much more aggressive in the approaches that they're taking um, to regulate content. Um, and so you, you see that in terms of, you know, the um, recent uh, laws that have been passed in places like Vietnam and um, uh, Turkey, the, the regulations against online harm um, that were just this week or last week promulgated uh, finally, officially in Pakistan, which Fariha spoke uh, eloquently about um, yesterday. Um, and, um, you know, those are going to create real challenges, uh, the, you know, data localization, um, forced uh, presence uh, of company representatives. These are all measures intended to essentially um, increase the leverage that these governments will have over the platforms and the platforms are going to have to decide um, either to comply and therefore um, um, make the sort of case by case determinations that they'll end up having to address much more challenging um, or to ignore them and risk being banned altogether from those markets. And so, um, you know, I think, I think the sort of cross border regulatory patterns um, are, are real. Um, that's kind of, you know, we look at that a lot, you know, in my role as GNI, you know, trying to sort of decipher the trends and the, the impacts that are happening on the regulatory side. Um, but then, of course, there's also these um, sort of other dynamics that are playing out below the, the sort of government regulation level um, that Dia hinted at. And um, uh, we, we also sort of hear a lot about that as well. And we try and facilitate communication across our members um, to help uh, the companies better understand some of these dynamics, you know, how maybe their content policies are having unintended consequences, where there may need to be uh, adjustments along the way. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. We could talk about this all day, but um, I know others will have more insightful things to say. So I'll talk um, briefly about the kind of the pressure dynamic that you referred to, Evelyn, and just I'll tell my own little quick story here. Upon taking my position in um, early July, I had two pieces of correspondence land on my virtual desk within a matter of days of taking the position. Um, one of those was from a, a secretary in a ministry in Australia who came comes at the issue of content moderation in the area of terrorism and violent extremism with a pretty aggressive, more must be done. As Jason alluded, there's obviously, you know, the idea of pursuing uh, regulation in this space is alive and well in Australia. So that was the very first piece of correspondence was that. My second piece of correspondence was from DIA and colleagues, a consortium or a, 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 a coalition of um, over a dozen civil society organizations who had had long standing dialogue with GIFCT that predated my arrival, but wanted to make sure I was aware of issues that remained insufficiently addressed or not resolved or, or were very much still very on, on their agenda. So. I mentioned that because if I if I looked at the Venn diagram identifying the slice of, of 
issues that were highest priority to those two separate um, correspondents, it'd be a pretty small um, Venn diagram. And so one, you know, one result might be you just throw up your hands and say, I can't cope with this. I've got pressure from all sides. But no, it actually, I think, puts more pressure on you to open up the aperture even wider for stakeholder involvement. Because then even when an individual stakeholder doesn't get their way or doesn't necessarily see an outcome that aligns 100% with their objectives or their interests, they at least can feel like there was a good faith process by which their conversation, their input was, was resolved or, or dealt with or addressed or, or consumed. Um, so that's why I said what I said earlier in the conversation about trying to bring more stakeholders into this, including from a much, much wider um, array of governments and civil society organizations that I'm already engaged with. Um, there's no reason to assume that, that governments from sub-Saharan Africa or Latin America will have an identity of view with European Union governments or the United States or, or, or Canada or New Zealand or Australia, other governments with which I am directly engaged with. There's no reason to assume that civil society organizations are a monolith across all of the different perspectives that they bring. So if anything, I want to widen the aperture, even if it if it makes things more complex and makes the, the, the solution set harder, harder to arrive at, I think we're more likely to have credibility with whatever solution sets we do have if you've done that. Julie, you spoke before about the fact that one of the ways you're trying to address the global challenge is by having lots of different members from representing different uh, countries and areas and regions and things. So I wonder if you could uh, specifically sort of address this question that's coming up um, and is reflected in Augustina's question as well, last question about like the, the tension between like the different um, expectations and sort of understandings and different pressures within um, different regions and how you're thinking about that as a sort of semi like global like you know Facebook's a global company and the oversight board is intended to be a global institution but how you're thinking about the the different regions and the diversity of views in that context. Yes, thank you. That's a very, very important question. The first thing I, I, I think it's important to remember how this how we got to this point. You know, increase. I, I'll give an example. It's at, at taking the technique of DI. I think it's been it's been very useful to make your point. Um, we have a problem around internet disconnection when governments decide that their citizens don't should not have access to internet anymore. Um, increasingly, that suppression has focused on social media platforms and messaging apps. Why? Because those platforms, the strategy adopted by companies uh, of these platforms has been, we should scale, we should go to these new markets, it's billions of users, we're gonna make a lot of money, but not thinking about the possible consequences at all. So the consequence is that you have countries in which people are advocating for censorship because they don't want their country to become the next Myanmar. And they're absolutely right, who would blame them? They don't want their country to be a place where people have the right basically give themselves the right to incite people to hate each other and you know cause violence. That's the reality today. There has been a void and censorship has been given in some parts of the world as its response to that void, a void that has been a responsibility from the platform. So the first thing I think uh, in, in, in uh, I wouldn't say responding, but at least in thinking about this question is, first of all, don't think that other places in the world are just, are just random places where you're going to you know, make money and that's it. No, there are human beings over there too. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing, now how, how to balance um, you know, this, the, the lack of engagement that has, been, uh, that has resulted in people distrusting or at least asking difficult questions or difficult moderation decisions from the platforms. I don't know if it's a, a, a solution, but that there needs to be more, first of all, conversations, simple conversations with people in these countries. I'm not saying that Facebook and Twitter should all have uh, you know, offices in each and every country where they go, but I think it's important to tell users and citizens that they matter and that, you know, they 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 they, they should be part of the solution. And unfortunately, that's not really the case as of now. It's something that in my other life, 
as a director of Internet Internet Sans Frontières. It's something that we've been trying to do a lot, especially in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, Western Central Africa. First of all, because it's a region where people speak French. Most of these platforms, you know, French is not, well, the uh, referred to it earlier, most of the products are in English. So French is okay, but imagine in, I don't know, Lingala or another language. So engaging is so important. It seems anecdotal, but it's, it's, it, it, for, for us, it's, it's been, it's proved to be important. And engaging means also involving civil society organizations, governments, of course, because obviously they're, you know, sovereignty issues are involved as well. And, you know, we know that governments also want to deal with uh, and, and enforce rules on freedom of expression according to their own in, in interpretation of that principle. But uh, when you offer a platform for discussion that includes those governments and their civil society organizations, something that many of these governments don't even do, the results can be, could be interesting. And I think, yeah, it, it, it's probably not the perfect response, but this idea of engaging uh, with honesty and you know humility sometimes too, uh, not coming with all the answers and also listening and working with uh, those organizations and citizens is can prove to be quite efficient as well with governments also, also unfortunately we have to do that as well. So yeah. So that's actually a perfect transition to the next question that I, I want to throw open to anyone that, that wants to take it. Um, you know, this idea that like, yes, we should engage more with stakeholders and um, and sort of Jason and Nick as well, you spoke a lot about how your stakeholders have increased over time or that you are intending to increase the number of stakeholders and, and companies and civil society organizations and things. But Dia raises this really important point, right? That time um, is a resource and we can't have like, and it, as popular as this space is, it's still only like, a, you know, a handful of people that we see all the time at the same panels or the same conferences in the same civil society organizations. And this is a huge tax on them and no one is really sort of uh, supporting them or uh, providing them the same resources. Um, and so, you know, Augustina raised this question, it's sort of like implicit in, in Molly's question as well um, in the in the chat about like, how do we think about institutional design in like this proliferation of different institutions? Um, we can have your different institutions, we can have corporate social responsibility. What extent is there duplication? And uh, do you think about that when you're thinking about your direction? Do you engage with each other about like, where are you sort of setting the, the boundaries of what you're trying to deal with? And how do we think about the benefits of like, you know, maybe we could have laboratories of multi-stakeholderism, or do we have this problem of too much duplication and you know taxing the same people over and over again to come and represent uh you know their country from the global south or their particular human rights interest in their civil society and things like that so i'd love to hear um your thoughts on that if i, if I could just quickly say a couple things um so i mentioned at the beginning of my presentation the fact that this sort of multi-stakeholder approach to corporate responsibility uh it, it is not only happening in this tech space, and we see it in, in other sectors as well. Um, and when I, before coming to GNI, worked in the US government, um, we saw this dynamic uh, across these various initiatives, right? That the civil society organizations were um, not only spread through thin within a particular sector, but often across these various sectors. It's the same few organizations that are participating in these kinds of corporate governance um, arrangements. Um, and they're you know heavily outspent, uh, obviously, and, and outresourced. Um, and, uh, and it's interesting because that's one form of what sometimes people talk about multi-stakeholderism. Um, the term also has a, a different but related meaning in the internet governance context, but that same problem exists in that space as well. Um, and so it's a huge challenge. And if we're going to actually be able to use these kinds of creative governance mechanisms to address any of these challenges in a real meaningful way, we have to solve it. We have to pay more attention to it. Um, uh, maybe just kind of pass the mic over to Dia because I think one of the spaces where I've seen this come to light most interestingly and also the dynamic that Nick was talking about um, with respect to sort of you know needing to broaden even the civil society conversation further is in the Christchurch Call Advisory Network um, which is a really interesting group um, and I put this, I'm on the Freedom Online Coalition Advisory Network which is a government entity working on these issues obviously GNI is its own thing um, you know I participate across a lot of these things too many 
Um, but that one is different in some important ways. And part of it is, is actually the diversity of, of sort of actors who are sitting around that virtual table. Um, and we've been having conversations very, very recently about just this research question. And Dia's really been leading a lot of that work. So maybe can kind of pass that over to her and she can reflect a little bit on, on that and other thoughts she may have. Um, yeah, so um, I'll just jump in to say that, uh, so I'm one of the co-chairs of the Christchurch Call Advisory Network, and I have to say I think it actually is a laboratory of, um, I think I think the, all of the conversations happening right now around sort of terrorist and violent extremist content, they are, this microcosm is actually a perfect example of what overlapping engagement can look like. And it really get has, it's out of control. I think some people are on like four or five different working groups or, or conversations about this and it becomes, you know, our whole lives. <laughs> um, so that being said, you know, I think with GIFCT is also um, a, a laboratory of multi-stakeholder engagement, the working groups. Um, I think one of the things that happens way too often, and this actually is, is gonna talk about some of the, the, the questions that were popping up in the chat as well about, you know, when you have civil society that comes in, that's also asking for things that are in opposition to human rights. Um, a lot of times we've seen conversations happen very separately. So as I mentioned with the, um, going back to this conversation with Facebook about their, about their names policy, you know, at the same time as um, some people are, are speaking to them about how they're getting kicked off, they also have domestic violence advocates who believe that real names are the best um, way to avoid that problem. Um, these conversations aren't necessarily companies then I think end up having to dance between these two different parties and not actually explain the, how they're having the different conversations. So I think there, there is a real need. And then of course that happens with government and companies as well. So there is a real need to bring these groups into, um, into conversations together. Now that being said, if you're going to do that, and I think the advisory network is a really good um, example of this. I think one thing is uh, don't ask for engagement without actually having a response. It needs to be clear where the engagement is going. What does it mean for me to go sit um, and take four hours to talk to an attorney that you contracted to do some sort of assessment? You know, where is that information going to go? And I think one, again, um, I know I keep mentioning the, the external oversight board, but I think something that was different there that stood out to me um, and, and why I'm hopeful. I mean, I have like, it's a whole other panel. I have my critiques, but I'm, I'm hopeful because um, we actually saw people who participated in the consultation saw the things that we said fed back into the documents that were produced. And we actually saw the things that we said go into um, some of the uh, uh, some of the structure itself. Um, with something like the, 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 that was also a pretty low lift, I think, um, for us on civil society just to go to a meeting. For something like the Christchurch Call Advisory Network, um, you have a few government representatives that are sort of... Uh, uh, engaging with companies, engaging with other governments, and then engaging with civil society. And there still really isn't necessarily a level playing field for that engagement, right? So I think, again, we need to be having more, um, what's the phrase we use, tripe, tripartite conversations where government and civil society and companies are coming together. Um, but we also, I think, just, I'm gonna go back to the resources thing, you know, we need resources, something, so something like the advisory network, and that's, that's part of what one of the things we're looking at now, it really is bringing in new voices. And actually, um, one of the members of the advisory network is Anjum Rahman, who also is uh, one of the members of the independent advisory committee. Um, you know, having folks from New Zealand to actually have, we also have a member of the advisory network who has a personal connection to Christchurch. You know, having people in those in conversations who have that kind of connection who have never those are folks who've never talked to a lot of us in, who are in the sort of digital rights space before. Um, and, you know, I think that was made made possible by having this open call. Um, and I think more of it would be possible again with, I think, a little bit more resourcing and, and support. Um, so, yeah, I don't I don't want to drive that point home too much, but just just to say, I think there are opportunities, but it requires work, it requires resources, and it requires a little bit more understanding of what all the different conversations are. Um, so knowing that there's the same civil society people who are on a GIFCT working group involved in the Christchurch call, also talking about the OECD transparency reporting requirements, also talking to governments about the, the terrorist content online regulation and the Digital Services Act and the online harms. We're in all of these conversations. So you know, um, where can they be brought together? I think there is some opportunity for bringing some of them together a little bit more. Yeah, I, I think that's um, an enormously valuable 
point. Uh, thank you. And that's what Jason's making the same point in the chat as well. Um, sorry, Nick, did you want to jump in on, on this? I, I wanted to just double, uh, I wanted to leave some time for Julia as well, because I just wanted to double down on the resources point. I certainly feel that responsibility with Gift CT that if we are going to try to grab people and want to have conversations for with them, um, we've got to find a way to make that possible for them. So I've got to build sufficient staff capacity at GIF CT so that when we do that, we do that in an efficient, smart, um, respectful way, meaning we're not just kind of going in answering a whole lot of education questions, help me understand your concerns, but that we actually value your time. And when we, if, if GIF CT does involve you in working group activity or other things like that, that we find ways to um, put a value on your time if if it if you are having to make choices between this activity and other kinds of activity. So the resources piece of this can cut across a number of different dimensions of the engagement process because I I get it I I know how small and how um, in some cases thinly um, spread um, many of these important voices are and we've got to find a way for the for the conversation to be made made much more accessible to that that community of stakeholders. Um, and resources are one way to do that. Um, on, on this point, so on the first point uh, on coordinating more the different uh, different institutions, uh, what I can say for the oversight board is that, again, we are really uh, keen on uh, engaging as much as possible and welcoming as much as possible um, the the expertise and uh, briefs and. Um, and opinions from from different groups, uh, including those that are that are represented here today. Uh, that's the first thing. And on the on the um, engagement, uh, I completely agree with what has been said on the issue of resources. It's important not also, I mean, because it's you know it's a way to value. <laughs> And expertise and the time of people who will come and also knowing what, what the outcome will be. But I think it, uh, it has also a positive effect on societies as, as a whole. Uh, when you uh, engage beyond you know, the usual suspect realm, uh, you give voice to new, 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 new experts on the first hand. And those people are also going to become you know, a good, uh, how can I say this? I uh, have the, the expression in French, but that won't help. Um, um, and uh, a, a de demultiplied effect? I don't know if that, that exists. I'm just trying something out there. Uh, a demul demultiplied effect in that they're going to, you know, train other communities as well, who in turn will become, you know, uh, in interlocutors for governments, but also for other uh, in institutions, including the UN or I'll give an example again. Uh, we we did uh, with, I'm sorry, something down with the board. We did work uh, in, in Cameroon uh, where uh, we were on the brink of having more or less the same situation as in as in Myanmar, and we we decided to uh, work with organizations in that country and connect them with teams at Facebook, at Twitter, at Google, the, the teams that we, the people that we knew. And what happened is that. Those people, those organizations, have themselves trained local organizations, rural organizations, which we have, which we hadn't thought about. And I think that's fantastic because it has gone to the point that it has become normal now to say spreading hate speech on social media is not something you should do, which was not the case two years ago. Or even the idea of having to report to push the report button to make sure platforms were aware there was a problem. That wasn't uh, a custom uh, in, 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 those, in that particular country, but now it has become something normal. And that's because communities had been included and in their turn, they included and they you know, passed the message to other communities. And that's an aspect of engagement that probably companies and even institutions like ourselves to, to think more about. It's not just about you know, being extractive and getting information from them, but it's also about well, having a helping, having a positive um, effect on societies as a whole. That's my belief. I'm not sharing board's opinion here. 
Fantastic. So thank you. Very, we are at time and I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So um, I just want to sort of close out firstly by apologizing for Australia. I should have done this earlier, but Nick made a comment about our terrible uh, regulatory stance and a lot of these issues. And it's, I'm not even going to try and defend it. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, one of the things, the big takeaways that I had from this enormously rich discussion, and thank you so much all for your time, um, was how much, how much trade-offs are involved in this as there always are in so many of these issues in this space, right? We have this thing of like, Maybe laboratories of multi-stakeholderism is great because we can see, try out different things and see how they work, but it creates this duplication and resources issue on the other hand. And similarly, engaging with people all over the place in different markets, different communities, different countries, really, really important. Again, the resources issue, but also this issue of like, you know, do we then create an opportunity for like capture or, um, you know, race to the bottom kind of threats uh, in markets that aren't as well protected, that, those kinds of issues as well. And finally, something that comes up a lot in this, and we didn't talk about it today, but I think is a really interesting one, um, and it ties back to another panel that was on uh, in this conference earlier, um, was this, this trade-off between like transparency and candor um, in these accountability structures, right? Um, so everyone's sort of in favor of transparency in the abstract. We were talking about this yesterday. Sounds great, but once you get to the specifics, uh, it can be really hard to nail down exactly what you want. And in these institutions, sometimes transparency can be a threat to the stakeholders being able to come in and say, this is what we're really doing, or this is what we really Really think this is what we really need and sharing information and sharing um, expertise in a, in a candid way um, that can facilitate uh, more effective however you measure that, uh, more effective outcomes. So lots and lots of trade-offs. Um, I want to end on a tiny note of optimism, uh, which is that, uh, you know, we, we had some good um, uh, sort of paths forward, some ideas for, you know, reducing this duplication issue, but also you know, I think that the, 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 the existence of all of these institutions um, and sort of the speed at which we're sort of seeing uh, a lot of these experiments and, and, and thinking around this is, is really encouraging. So thank you very much, everyone, for your time and uh, for everyone for attending and your fantastic questions. Uh, I look forward to doing this uh, again sometime. Yeah, thank you thank so you. much. Thank you so much to all of you. Evelyn, we have a note taker or rapporteur who's been uh, uh, taking notes for the session. So I appreciate you making her job so much easier by pulling out all the highlights in a, in a, in a quick spiel. Um, but thank you so much. We'll be back again in about 10 minutes. Uh, I see people are already arriving for a discussion on devolved moderation structures. So join us again for that and take a quick break beforehand. Thank you all.